the language of the universe. But I don't understand it. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Math and Physics Podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we welcome you to episode number 104, where today we are going to be talking about the history and just a little quick knowledge recap of our sun. Yeah, we've never done an episode on just our sun, which right. is actually a very important object when it comes to astronomy, mm. but more in the past, because now we kind of see our sun as just another star right even though it's it's still important because it's our sun and we get to look at it close up which we can't really do with other stars um but yeah it's just another star main sequence pretty average um back in the day though they didn't know that mm -hmm. so it was like it was it was a big deal and so we're going to talk about kind of the cultural historical elements that uh, mm -hmm. the sun kind of plays into and then also in the recent past the things that we were able to do by looking at the sun because nowadays i guess because of the dawn of telescopes and especially space telescopes and whatnot we can see very very number one far into the past and number two just far <laughs> it's just far so we can see a lot of other solar systems we can compare them and we can see we can come you know here and there but we can but back in the day as you very well said that was the only one option you just that's the one thing you see in the sky you can maybe see a little twinkles here and there, but the only real thing that you can ever really measure or really, you know, feel the effect of, number one, are the sun. I guess, yeah. Right? Are the sun. Daily, imagine like in like thousands of years ago, you're just feeling this heat from this object and you're <laughs> like, why? Why am I, why is it hot? Yeah. In the, in the shade. They never understood they radiation. It. They never understood that radiation carries energy, which is basically heat. So like, what do you think they thought about back then? You know, like, yeah, exactly. Why exactly. does... Why does when we have an insulated versus, you know, conductive home, it makes me feel colder in the winter versus warm? You know, the simple things, simple things. So I think this episode, I think we want to try and bring it back to kind of what it was when we knew nothing mm -hmm. and then maybe take it from there. And the, learning the history behind a subject is always, you know, really good for building your foundation on the content that we know today because it's not only about how or what we know but how we got to this point and what were what were kind of the ideas of the past and how those ideas evolved changed and obviously there were paradigm shifts where oh my god the sun is just another star <laughs> what is happening um mm. all these like just the history the timeline of it all is I, I find it fascinating just to to study to read just to just to know i find it i find it awesome so uh, before we actually get into the episode, we have maybe a little bit of news. Um, so you might have noticed last time mm -hmm. we posted a podcast was, I think, three weeks ago, which I guess, you know, not bad compared to, I mean, it's, it's pretty bad compared to what our old schedule was like. But uh, this is the summer right now. I'm doing a summer research project with the university. Rayhan is doing, he's building rockets with the, with the rocket team here at U of T. And, uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time just doing stuff in our mm -hmm. field. Mm -hmm. We're even like studying a little bit on the side, um, to get ready for our fourth year courses, which are going to be very interesting, very provide interesting a lot of indeed. content <laughs> for the podcast. Indeed. Um, so look forward to that, but yeah, we're trying to record as much as we can. Um, but we do have like kind of location difficulties because we're not always you know during the summer we're not always staying at the same place and i think it's always better to record a podcast in person versus online um yeah so now we are recording one right mm -hmm. now so here we are so here we are anything else that we want to talk about i think uh we already mentioned that our downloads are at five hundred and thirty thousand. We beat that 500,000 barrier, so thank you everyone for downloading. Mm -hmm. Spotify followers almost at 28,000. Dang. So thank you everyone who continues to follow us, continues to rate our podcast. Get the boys to 30K. We, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> indeed. And uh, loved all the responses to our recent Instagram posts where we kind of just recommended you guys to recommend us any topics. 
very interesting topics because some of which uh, we can't really get into because either we've already got into in how much detail we know and we would need like a professor to do more or they're just topics that we just can't talk about. Like we just don't really know enough. Thank you still for the suggestions. Still fantastic. Thinking about still organizing like professors for those uh, professors and researchers for those episodes. But unfortunately, we won't be able to just do them ourselves. So there's yeah, that. That's right. Also, we just opened our business bank account, which means that we can get the merch going. Finally, finally. Um, I think we like we tried to actually get the merch store going before like all of the business stuff. But then we realized, you know, we might as well just actually do it right. And that took a whole lot of time mm -hmm. to set up, mm -hmm. but now it is officially set up. So we're gonna get the merch store. <laughs> we're gonna finally we're gonna open it finally. up. Um, it's gonna be a website, an actual website that you guys can go to and actually buy merch. We're also we also might add the option on on Instagram because I know that they're yeah. also very nice with shops and whatnot. So we'll take a look at the logistics later. But just letting you know that the account is now active, so we're down to open up merch whenever. Boom. Okay, that's it. Enough talk. Let's get into... Uh, Actually, comment oh, of the week really quickly. Comment of I, the I week. Thought, I don't know why I thought... Okay, sorry. <laughs> Let's continue. Um, <laughs> this episode's comment comes from Clayton. They say, Hey guys, I really got into math and physics this past year in college and it gave me the courage to switch my degree from marine science to astronomy and physics. Oh my. I'm now a tutor in math and I've started math and a physics club at my college. <clears throat> Oh my. I found you guys a few months ago, but have listened to every one of your videos. Thanks for all the good work you two do. Thank you so much for the what comment. What a comment, Clayton. Thank you. If you want to be next episode's comment of the week, let's say, uh, make sure to come to this YouTube video on YouTube and leave a comment in the comment section and then we might pick it if you Very are simple. deemed deserving <laughs> <laughs> let's, not, let's not put it that way but sure okay right. let's get into Boom. our sun maybe we can backtrack to our solar system and think a little bit about oh way back when let's not let's not even start with observation let's just start with a little bit of history straight history lesson where does our sun come from mm. so currently our current understanding of it or how most stars form, like the most, like the process of stellar evolution, starts from a nebula, of, or basically a fancy word for a cloud of gas in space, right? We've discussed it many times. And when this nebula becomes big enough, such that gravity can do its job, stellar evolution takes place. And I'm pretty sure we've already gone through that process mm -hmm. quite a few times in the is 103 it, episodes. Is it called a nebula before it was ever a star? I think a nebula is after. A it's star. still called like a protostellar nebula, is it not? Really? I, I would still, I would still think it would be called a a, a type of nebula, not like mm. obviously like a planetary, not like a specific form. Obviously, that would be after a star has died. But I think a nebula, it still would still be yeah. correct terminology. So back in the early stages ish Way of back. the universe, there was a lot of hydrogen and around twenty six percent helium mm. in the universe, just floating mm. around. And uh, interesting fact, we actually calculated this in our astrophysics class. So that was pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there is gas floating around. But what happens is that if you have a collection of gas, you just draw a boundary around it. And the density and temperature of that gas is just right. You can calculate something called the genes mass. Mm. And so if the mass of that gas um, is actually above the genes mass, then that cloud can collapse and a whole bunch of interesting dynamics go down during the collapse. But you know, if you, if the conditions are right, it will collapse into a star. The problem is that with the very first stars that formed, there was only hydrogen and helium in those stars, which means that you didn't see things like planets floating around because planets are made of other things that there just wasn't in the past. And so, once those stars, let's say, you know, it was a really big star, it went past the main sequence and then it collapsed and exploded. And in that explosion, it created heavier elements. Mm -hmm. And those were just sent out into the universe. I just want to cut you off one sec because it's just important for what you're defining. The word metal, metal rich and metal poor. 
So like what you what you just defined are population three stars for which we haven't actually found any really metal poor stars, the pure hydrogen helium stars back in the when the universe formed, when there was no real metal that even could make them up. That's when just those pure stars were formed. And those are called population three to which to this date, I don't believe we've actually found any, but they're still theorized. But then, as you were saying, like in the whole process, as the stars or multiple stars get built, they simply fuse into heavier and heavier elements. And then once finally one star down the down the road explodes in a supernova or in any sort of fashion where its materials from the core are expelled, the metal or the metal richer core than it was before will now start to form another cloud that then goes into another process all, all over again. Yeah, well, basically in like the stellar neighborhood, when a star explodes, all of the heavier elements kind of just go into that neighborhood and then which populates the gas in space right. with heavier elements. And even though they're not metals, we still call it, you know, it's part of the metallicity of a star, even though it's things like carbon or I whatever. Mean, they are metal, what you yeah, there are metals, yeah, but it's, metal. you know, they're not all metals like we call metals. They're not metals because on <laughs> Earth we don't think of them yeah. as metals, but they are called, chemically, they are called yeah, metals. When, so as, as long as it's heavier than hydrogen and helium, I think we categorize mm -hmm. that into like the metal acidity of the star. Um, so yeah, now you have other elements floating around in space and then you have more clouds collapsing, creating now stars with higher metallicity, which, you know, has different impacts on its evolution and things that happen inside the core. Remember, um, not only does a star have higher metallicity, but like, so does the whole, like, like the whole gas cloud yeah, that eventually cloud. turns into the solar system Yeah, has the other metals, which then turns into rock, which then turns into what we have today yeah. as the earth. So if you have a cloud with heavy elements, the star can collapse, but then the stuff around it kind of just like floats around that mass because of gravity and then things clump together and then you have planets, mm -hmm. which are made of obviously not hydrogen and helium. There's some here, mm -hmm. but the like the soil and the, the core of right. the earth and it's it's all heavy elements. And if you compare it to the size of the sun, it's not that much stuff mm -hmm. that's here. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that that is how kind of we ended up in, in this location mm -hmm. around the sun because the sun is actually Second generation? Third. A third so, generation star. So, the, again, the, so the second generation stars are mostly known as population two. And I don't know why it's the other way around, like for a second, third, and three, two, one. But I guess the second generation stars are usually known as population two. But again, that's not the category. Technically, for it to be population two, it all depends on like the spectrum, on like the absorptions. So it's like if it's weak or strong absorption. So it all depends on the metallicity of the star. So in this case, a population two star would already have some metal, so it would have a little stronger lines. So we are able to tell the populations apart via basically the absorption lines. But then the generation comes from, well, what exact generation? And then to be completely honest, that's not like a exact science, right? Like technically, if you think about it, like the second generation star could have also had like a third, one, like another yeah, one just explode right. and just add into it, you know? Yeah. So there can be like other little bits and pieces here and there yeah. that adds into it, but... Because it's our, not just one star that explodes and makes exactly, a second exactly, one, right? Exactly, it's, a whole, it's multiple that add into it. Yeah. So, uh, so our understanding of our star is that it's a population one star. So it has an X amount of metallicity and X amount of, and it absorbs X amount of lines to which we categorize it as a population one star for which it falls under the third generational star. Again, the, the generate the population is pretty well categorized. The generation again is kind of iffy here and there because as we were just saying, it kind of depends on, it can be a bunch load from everywhere. But mm -hmm. here's the thing. People always think that, you know, our solar system is, oh, it's just perfect. It's just perfect for life. It's just perfect for this. But that's like far from true. And that's like kind of harsh reality. But we haven't found them yet, mainly because our ways of searching as we've actually gone through in like transits and like how we actually search for stars nowadays is looking for solar systems with certain properties. Like a lot of the ones that we look for are like bigger planets, like big planets where they're close to the sun. Like those are very mm -hmm. easy for transits, right? Where bigger planets are closer to the, uh, to their own star. So those are mainly the ones that we're focused on, which is why to the rest of them, we're like, Oh, we're so weird. But in reality, we're far from it. It's just a regular, 
cloud of gas that just happened to condense into this spot where the Goldilocks zone and all that, you know, all that jargon is not is not really even that much. I think our solar system is actually very diverse in, for in, a solar system. In what way? Because you can have a solar system with no planets. You can have a solar system with just... Okay, I guess that, that point like, could be With made. one gas giant or just, you know, a couple rocky planets. But we have pretty much the entire spectrum, except for hot gas giants hot jupiters yeah. hot, jupiters. Yeah, yeah, hot jupiters we don't have any of those but if you look at the planets we have and we have a moon right i mean it most wasn't, most things have satellites like most planets have as satellites. like prominent as okay, okay like now, i don't know it, about that nobody's been there to be honest i think it's kind of lucky that we have a moon that is that big because mo- i think i think it's fair to say most planets don't have like a big moon yeah, maybe like smaller. Like, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm I'm talking. I'm, most I'm, planets I'm not, have multiple. Well, it's actually weird that we have no, one. Exactly. Moon. I was gonna say. <laughs> That's I was weird gonna that say, we have one moon. Not only do we have one moon, but we don't have zero, and we don't have many. two, yeah, three, yeah, four. <laughs> like you, you can have, I guess, unlimited amount of moons, yeah, but I mean, there's no sixty-seven. I don't right? think what's, there's. What's, uh, I don't think there's an upper bound on. Amount of I mean, moons. I'm sure there's like how much you can Dude, pack can you, into orbits. Can you count each rock in Yo, no, the Yo, no, there's Saturn's definitely rings? a limit. Let me tell you why. Because after a certain distance, you get too fast, so you escape. But if it's escape smaller. velocity. But escape a lot. You're still traveling at a certain speed if you're far away. No, but if you're traveling slowly. But close. Far away. How are you traveling slowly far away? Well, that's or, just how it is. I mean, well, technically, sorry, sorry. I'm speaking the other way around. I'm saying if you get far enough to the point where you leave its sphere of influence... You will well, get. You never it. leave. Well, of course. What do you mean? If you're going slow enough, you're always in the gravitational influence of everything. But then you'll be also pulled by the sun well, even stronger if you're far enough. Far if you're, that's what I'm saying. There's going to exactly. be a limit. I'm saying it depends how far. There's going to be a limit. Is all I'm saying. There is a limit. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, a little historical context for like you know how our sun was created and how we're here. But it's kind of powerful how the whole how we are like the very the one one moon one i guess one yeah. star too it's pretty i mean it's not, uh, i think that's pretty common. i mean binary yeah. star systems are also common but yeah. like i guess it's 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 still pretty cool that we had just we just have the one it, i think having two moons would have been the coolest yeah because multiple eclipses yeah <laughs> that would be the coolest yeah, that would be the coolest <laughs> also our our earth's earth moon system would have been a the three body problem oh which would have right. been way yeah, harder three body problem, right? i guess the moon doesn't really it would have a lot of that. more it would oh, have more tides, Lagrangian points the tides would the be tides crazy would be weird because i don't even think they would i don't know how that would work well it depends on like this if one is way bigger than the other then it would be like micro like influences on anyways because is... they would probably like tug on each other too right no, yeah, like no. i don't know i don't know how that would work yeah that would be i guess yeah i mean systems like that exist but uh yeah um so Moving on, from, right, moving, uh, on, moving on from this kind of stuff. We are now here, but right. once upon a time, we were not here. Wow. There were Insight. smaller biological entities walking around, swimming around on the earth. How did we get to this point exactly? At some point in history, somebody looked at the sky and said, whoa, what is that? <laughs> you know what, <laughs> what? I mean? I mean, somebody, somebody had, somebody had to say it. <laughs> Someone had to say it. I thought you were like talking about evolution the way no, I'm like, oh, how did I, we go from? No, I was. <laughs> I'm saying we evolved to the point where we could look at the sky and just ask like, what is the sun? And what are the stars? Conscious and enough. And why are they there? Right. And we are doing the same thing right now except with more complicated things like CMB mm-hmm. or, you know, FRBs or whatever. More complicated, more distant objects. But when you don't have the tools to do so, your cosmic model is based off of just whatever you can see with your eyes, right? Right. So what do you know? You know there is a really bright thing that goes around every day by definition (laughs) and then at night there are stars a moon and then there are also transients which are one-off events like supernovae and such just like um like um showers 
meteor showers. Meteor, me, they're not. They're not one-off events. That's no, pretty common. They're transients though, which means that they What's, happen. What was the definition of so a transient? A transient is like if you have a star that explodes. Right. It can't explode twice. Oh. It explodes once. Okay. So it's a transient event. So it's something that happens once. Right. Okay. So like meteor showers don't happen. Yeah, once but a meteor once. shower. You'll it, never see those meteors. The, I mean, it, the it same wraps around every every. I mean, it depends on the, the meteor. The same meteor. Like Haley's comet. No, comets are different. Okay, I guess. I think meteors they die out like. Meteor showers. Right. Meteors, it's, it's when by they enter, definition, enter the atmosphere. They enter the yeah, atmosphere. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you'll never see those exact ones. I guess meteors you fall down yeah, yeah. on the Earth again. Yeah, yeah. But the and event itself happens multiple times. Multiple but times. It just that exact thing happened once. Yeah, I get right. that. I get that. So there are these like one-off events where you, they had really you know weird ideas about in the past. Like the sky was falling and totally believable yeah, at that time i guess what else i mean what else <laughs> i mean yeah do you say about that <laughs> right right i mean when you see for example events like the super moon like when the moon is closest to the earth and like what do you think yeah like what do you think like it's just full moon glaring at your window or like i guess no windows back there like just yeah. glaring at your face <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> what do you imagine yeah exactly you know and i guess also you could kind of see the milky way I guess back, back then, then, yeah. I guess back then you could totally. There were no real no. I mean, yeah, yeah no, there were no, no lights. No lights. Yeah, this is like BC, second century, yeah, third yeah, century. Yeah, yeah, way, way, yeah. way before. So, you can see all these kinds of things, right? And right. You gotta, you have to ask why, and so they just made up explanations because that's what you do, and it's what astronomers do today. A lot of mythology comes from the yeah. from here. I mean, realistically, mythology is just somebody gives an explanation. Everyone's like, oh, yeah, that's valid, <laughs> valid. And then now that we're smarter, we go, oh, that's mythology because it's what like they had like these weird ideas. Yeah. But we're doing the same thing. We're looking at things in the sky and we're like, we're, we, we give, I mean, it's all fake explanations, right? Because I mean, we never uh, really know. We never really math. know. Right. We have things to we support our arguments, right? which is quite an advantage. Mm -hmm. at the end of the day though you know yeah what can you say yeah. but they had explanations and um right so in a lot of cultures they would say that the sun is life it represents life because without the sun there's no life there are no plants there's just nothing valid is that can there be like microbes? Well, technically, I mean, there's still like, the, well, we don't know about any other life, to be honest, yeah. but like there's still like theoretical stuff, like because we see titans, oceans and whatnot, oceans of methane. And that really, to be honest, receives almost negligible light. So who knows? You know, that could right. be some sort of some microbe or some organism right. that we don't even understand could be living in well, those lakes. Yeah. When we didn't even know what microbes were. Exactly. We don't even. The exactly. sun was, you know, you wake up. In the morning, you see the sun, you get life, you get energy, mm. you go to water your crops and the sun is just feeding them <laughs> pure light, right? Um, so we know about, you know, a lot of ancient civilizations, right. maybe indigenous North American civilizations. Um, in every civilization, the sun was an important symbol because how could it not be? Right. Right. So yeah, they're also like those sun gods, for example, in Egypt. I mean, like the sun itself is, represents something very big in a lot of religions and a lot of cultures, and just a lot of things because I guess it's just so prominent in the sky, right? I mean, who can't bask in its glory? Exactly. But I guess coming to the physics side, how do we how do we analyze these things, right? How do we how do we take this and be like, okay, what is the radius or what is the distance? Right. So the only thing you can do at this point is look. Right. You have to look. <laughs> you, look. You have to. And what do you notice Stop. immediately? I mean, don't, don't, don't look at the sun, though. Right. Disclaimer. Right. Don't look at the sun. But that's what they would do. They had to. In <laughs> thousands of no, years No, they ago. for sure had to. Exactly. And uh, what do you see? Well, you see the sun rise on one side and go down on the other side. Right. I guess I don't know if they knew about East North no, West. I don't think so. Ah, uh, don't quote me on that. Magnetic field. <laughs> I don't think so. No, but they probably had some sort of direction. Right. Maybe you can assign. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, don't, don't quote us on that. <laughs> the, but yeah. The point is, you see this. You see the patterns of the sun, the short term patterns, and also the longer term patterns, as in the right. seasons, right? Where the sun rises a little bit 
lower at its peak and in the winter and then a little bit higher. The days get longer and shorter. And then also you can associate that to the effects of that, right? You notice the days are longer, the trees are growing, it's hotter outside, you think life. The earth mm. is receiving life. Wow. And in the winter, in some places, right, you get snow, the trees lose their leaves, it gets cold, the days get shorter, you think death, Oof. right? Just the opposite of right. life. And so that also plays into the ideologies back in the day, how, you know, the sun would come and go mm. when the sun was under the horizon. It would be nighttime, you know, cold, scary, death vibes. Right. Right. right? Kind of tough. So you can immediately, just by looking at the patterns of the sun, you can already associate different ideas to, even though it has, it's, it's an objective truth right the the whole situation that's going on in the solar system even though you're kind of blind to the bigger picture humans just automatically assign feelings and things to events mm -hmm. uh the mayans actually um they regarded the sun to be you know of course it represented life vitality productivity but they also saw the sun as an internal thing as in like it like they, 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 they brought the idea of the sun into um yeah the idea that it brings warmth right. into their bodies yeah right and it feeds their consciousness that's kind that of powerful of stuff right very powerful yeah um there are other you know in egypt right there, there was the sun god ra, ra. Yeah. and the idea was that ra would go in his chariot and bring the sun across the sky. Oh, was that the right? idea? That was, was that the, the idea. idea? Wow. Uh, you know, it was a source of life, light, crops. That's kind of Good weather, right? So again, in most cultures, it's kind of a similar idea. Yeah. Most of them. Exactly. Most, most of them. And s the Mayans in particular had very detailed documentation mm -hmm. of the sun. Because what else could you do? Right? You just write down things that happen. And things that happen are, for example, very notably, eclipses. Oh. What right. is happening if you're chilling in the sun and all of a sudden, in the middle of the day, the sun just disappears? It goes dark, right? What, what kind of ideas come into your head, right? The provider of life gets shunned, right? Mm. Thinking about end of the world, right? So that is also kind of, it's, it's a source of the ideas where, oh, in 2012, the world was going to end, had to do with the Mayan calendar, which, you know, tracked lunar phases, eclipses, and all that stuff. Uh, very interesting stuff. Wow. 1375 BC was the first recorded solar eclipse. Wow. That's pretty impressive. That Imagine pretty what impressive. you see at that time, like what you feel. You look at that corona and you're like, oh my exactly that's why and by the way for anybody wondering right now thinking oh they're not talking about math or physics right now actually <laughs> let's just break it down really quickly i guess i can know th this is a really good topic because i actually asked him this exact yeah. question i'm like where's the math and physics in this? exactly and then he said this <laughs> right now what do we do in math and physics we observe we theorize and we write things down and then we just keep doing that, right? Right. I guess it's kind of a more complicated loop, but it's in, in general, it's, you know, we observe something, we try to explain it, or maybe we theorize something and then we try to observe it. It's, it's all connected though. If you were to go back to the ancient times, that's exactly what they're doing. Mm -hmm. They're doing astronomy. They're doing physics, trying to explain the world around them but with just very limited tools. And so this is actually a very important stepping stone in the scientific progress that we have made since the beginning of time, right? Even though it's not physics. I it's, mean, it's still very it's much still is. physics. It's, it's observing the universe as well as we can right. and writing down our best explanations. So now, yeah. if you want to learn the best way to think and write down these explanations. Hmm. Go check out the astrophysics course on brilliant.org, the sponsor of today's video. 
thank you to Brilliant for sponsoring today's video. And as we, as I just mentioned, if uh, you want to learn anything about parallax, as, as we're going to come into, about, uh, about stars themselves, the life cycle of stars, stellar evolution, as we glimmed or glossed over today, but have gone into in depth in previous episodes, check out brilliant.org. And as usual, if you want uh, a little sneak peek into our own, you can go to brilliant.org forward slash MPP. And the first 200 people to sign up get 20% off the premium subscription for the whole year. What a crazy deal. What a crazy deal. So why not just go ahead? You can either click the link in the description below or just simply search up brilliant.org forward slash MPP and go check out any course. Also good to let you know that the first lesson of all the courses are completely free. So if you just want to check it out, why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Speaking of observing. I was just going to, that's exactly down. how I was going to start. But okay, go ahead. <laughs> Sp speaking of observing and writing down, the Mayans actually, like I said, they wrote down eclipses that occurred and actually tried to predict when eclipses would happen in the future. It turns out it's not that easy and they kind of got it right, but they couldn't actually predict the days and time that they would happen they would be able to predict a time frame within which it would happen and in that they were fairly accurate mm -hmm. um so there's actually something called the dresden codex which is an ancient mayan i guess it's like a rock tablet that they wrote things right. down on i don't know if they had books no maybe no. some skin <laughs> that they wrote yeah, maybe stuff like on. a stone tablet but yeah right, it, right. It, the the dresden codex is a stone tablet and there are a, there are many pages i think like 18 pages are dedicated to eclipses wow and it is actually one of the most like Deep. incredible oh. like relics of yeah imagine back the then. mayan civilization wow right? and yeah they they wrote down eclipses mm -hmm. and I would have done the same, to be honest. <laughs> like, I mean, what, it's pretty what, impressive like, what, do you what do? people do. It's pretty right. impressive what people do with observation. Similar yeah. in like 28 BC, some Chinese astronomers determined that there were sunspots on the sun. Just by looking at it, they just saw that there were uh, dark patches on the sun. I mean, I guess technically you can actually look at sunspots. Again, don't. Disclaimer, don't look at the sun. But if you do look with your naked eye and it is prominent enough, you can look at sunspots. Again, a quick reminder, sunspots are like this, these cold environments in the sun where the magnetic field is so concentrated that the heat can't escape. So we just see them as black because the light can't escape to us. So that's why we call them, I mean, that's why they're called sunspots. And interestingly enough, sunspots actually give you a very, very, very detailed explanation into what exactly is happening in the sun. Because very, very different from Earth. Because the Earth, for example, is one huge rock that's just rotating. And you're like, okay, well, everything is probably like this, but that's far from true. The sun, apparent, oh, that's not apparently, but the sun is plasma. And each latitude, each layer can be thought of as a separate layer. Each of one of them rotating at their own speeds. And this is called the differential rotation of the sun. And interestingly enough, sunspots give you this exact thing. Basically, by looking at how a sunspot moves across the sun, you can say, oh, wait, this one moved a little bit faster than this one, but it's higher up. So that means this is moving faster than this part of the sun. And then you're like, oh, the sun is not uniform. So obviously that, that part of the analysis wasn't done back then, but simply looking at the sun and determining that sunspots, these black spots on our star existed, was done all the way back in like 28 to, or like 30 B.C., so very, very long time ago. And was, I think it was confirmed only by Galileo when we actually got the mm -hmm. first telescope and we could actually see that there were in fact spots on the sun. Mm. So I, I, th I think that's a pretty cool uh, thing of just observation, literally. But again, very dangerous observation, but not that yeah. they knew it actually, anything better back then. I read this on NASA's website, um, but you can actually look at an eclipse with your naked eye. All right. As oh, long right. as oh, the moon is exactly on top of the sun, as soon as it moves a little bit out of the way and there's like the tiny corona, little yeah. spots, yeah. then it's dangerous. Yeah. But there may be like a couple seconds where you can actually look at it, but don't risk it. You know what I mean? Right, right. 
Yeah. Interestingly enough, now uh, I forget when this was. Obviously, I'm assuming after the invention of telescopes. But um, there was this one discovery made. I was just talking to you about this where uh, to view the sun through a telescope, they placed this filter that it was coronagraph coronagraph it's called a coronagraph where they kind of simulate an eclipse and the corona oh hence the name i guess was seen to be extremely hot where like temp like things that it were doing you know again i can't really explain but like phenomena that were seen by scientists were discovered or were stated to be not possible with the current understanding of the surface of the sun so what that meant was that absolute outermost layer which is known as the corona or like the like the atmosphere of the sun the corona layer of the sun was in fact like hundreds of times hotter than the surface of the sun while the surface is a mere 5000 kelvin right something like that the yeah. atmosphere is nearly a million kelvin what and that is simply because of convection how heat transfer works in the sun i didn't know and that. number one that's how we that's why and how we see that absolute coronal layer or the or the ring you know how people see in eclipses very very sharp because that's that's what we're getting at that that's, that's, that's the only time because if we think about it at every other point in our uh in in what we're seeing from the sun is basically like middle to lower layers of the atmosphere because a lot of the higher layers are getting sucked in because of heat and whatnot and because of the way that the sun's trend like the convection is working however when everything is blocked we're basically kind of forced to see that outer layer. And then we're able to kind of determine, oh, wait, that's way hotter than what it's we thought. It's a million degrees? It's a million Kelvin. That's Let me crazy. Uh, okay. Temperature of, uh, yeah, because I was looking at it and it's um, it's pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Approximately 2 million Kelvin Damn. is the temperature of the corona. Now, the core is, is 15, more. 15, right? 20? Yeah. Something like that. Kind of the 7 or it's, 6? Six, no. No, seven. seven. It has to be seven. So then that would be, yeah. So about in the same ballpark range, the atmosphere as the core of the star. Wow. Or at least, yeah. So that's one thing, again, that we were helped or like was discovered through just observations of the sun. Just like looking at it in a different way. Just trying to simulate what we see once in a very rare occasion to every day in your backyard. You know? Mm. Yeah. Pretty incredible. And uh, didn't you look at the sun right. with a telescope? Right. So in in, uh, in grade 11, I had this co-op job where um, my task was to basically write this, like do this analysis on the differential rotation of the sun. And what we did was we used this telescope with obviously UV filters and whatnot to record the sunspots every day. We did this every day for three months and or two months. And at the end of the two months, we basically simply tracked, literally like hand tracked by like superimposing these. This is, I guess I didn't really know Python or anything back then. Also, this would probably be harder with programming. So I just, we just like superimpose them together and just calculate like by um, hand the rotation of the sun on every layer. And we would be like, oh, there's a, it's, it's rotating differentially. And could you see like... The little the flares and stuff. Well, unfortunately, not because that's not how filters work. Because the filters block all that out, oh, right? Oh. So it's basically just showing. Oh, so it's just like a gray image, right? Yeah. Exactly, it's a gray image with these black spots. Wow. And the black spots are your sunspots because, again, what it does is it's already lowering the almost temperature. You can think of it as the image, but because the temperature of the blacks of the sunspots are so low, it's basically black, right? Mm. So that's what we're seeing. That's how we can analyze. So obviously now with the with te telescopes and whatnot, it's a whole new ballpark. It's a whole new ball game. So it's a little bit different, but always nice to go back and think about, you know, what, what they were thinking about so, and how they were thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Bringing it back to the past again. Let's go back to the past. Let's you see back. the sun and you ask yourself once again, what is that, right? I've, tr I've been tracking it for a while. But actually, what is it? Is it far? Is it big? You have no idea. How exactly would you go about answering that question? Now, this also goes hand in hand with asking about the size of the world hmm. that you're living on. And also the size of the moon, mm -hmm. the distance to the moon, and you know the relationship between 
all of these objects that you can see. Now, actually, relating these three, because, you know, the Greeks and other people in the past were very uh, into math and geometry, thank God for trigonometry, because pretty much everything you do ever is trigonometry. Um, and calculating the distance to the sun can be done using trigonometry. And also a little bit of logic. No, a lot of logic. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of, a lot <laughs> of logic. It's not easy trig. If you think about it, right, when the moon is a half moon, right, that means that the sun is illuminating it one way, and we are looking at it directly perpendicular to the direction that the sun is looking mm -hmm. at the moon, right? Because we're looking at exactly half of it half of the illuminated side and so lo and behold you have a right angle triangle and so with the information of how far the how far the um the, the moon is and also the angle or one of the angles in that triangle you can calculate the distance to the sun and that's how it was done actually well that was a very poor way of doing it doing it actually okay yeah yeah, yeah. let me actually introduce yeah. you to uh a very poor way of doing it. Yeah. So um, our, the understanding was, okay, if we can see, because, okay, the, 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 whole, the whole basis of this depends on, can we determine the angle from the earth to the sun? And at that time, the answer was no, because this was done in like 200 BC. Hmm. Um, who was it done by? I forgot. I had the name right here somewhere. I might get it up in a second, but... It was basically done by an astron. No, no, not no, Hipparchus. That's, that's Hipparchus the, was well. different. It's. I said it with A. I was. I literally continued. Archimedes. No, I wish. <laughs> I don't no, know. no, no, no. <laughs> anyway, so the idea was, as you very well, very well explained. The only problem was again determining that one side. If you draw the angle in your head, the only angle that, or, or the, if you draw the right angle in your head, the triangle in your head, the angle that we need is the Earth Sun angle. So that was estimated by looking at it. I told you about this. It was estimated, and I don't even know how, to be 87 degrees. Which, by the way, in this situation, is like the distance is very sensitive no, to the it angle. It was actually 89 degrees. So listen to how much off he was. Yeah. The actual distance, or, or well, let me just start with this. The distance that he got from the sun was 19 times farther than the moon, the Earth-Sun distance. The Earth-Sun is 19 times farther than Earth-Moon. Yeah. The actual value is 340. Oh, okay. So she yeah. was quite, quite <laughs> not right. Yeah. Let's just keep it that way. But then we come to um, we come to Haley. What was the year of Haley? I had it somewhere here as well. Sorry, I have a lot of tabs open right now. So I'm trying to see the year. Where was it? 1716. So way, way, way later. Haley proposed a way better way to calculate this. Now, obviously, granted, we have the addition of telescopes and whatnot, but here it is. Using Venus, using Venus, using the transit of Venus. So Venus is kind of powerful because it's an inner planet, and when it transits, we can, and it's big, not like, unlike Mercury, so we can see it. So when it transits across, well, it obviously, number one, takes away part, some part of our sky so we can literally see it transit through the sun. So interestingly enough, because these transits happen like once in a lifetime, Haley actually wrote a letter on how to do it in case he couldn't do it in the future. Mm. So we always have that, you know. Oh, it hasn't happened? No, no, no. I mean, of course it happened, oh. which is how we know it now. Okay. But I'm saying he, he wrote it because it's a once in an off event, right? If you don't get it right, you get it wrong basically ah. i mean you you gotta get it is what i'm saying and you gotta track it very very precisely so here's how they did it pretty insane really so taking the so two different locations on the earth polar you know the distance between them so again you're using the maximum distance possible again so you're looking at the transit of venus from two different spots now if you think about the uh, transit of venus on the sun or the transit of any star across the sun it takes up any planet or any, sorry, any planet across the star. It'll take up some, I mean, I think we've spoken about this, right? Like it'll, uh, it'll obscure some area. Yeah, exactly. It'll obscure some brightness from the star, right? So you'll see something traversing its area. 
So from one side of the planet, you'll see some area, and from other side of the planet, you'll see another area being traversed. So what they did, by calculating the precise time, and this is what was very important, because the time oh, com is completely off if you get the time wrong. By calculating the precise time of each transit, they got the length, like the two transit lengths, and from that, they basically, okay, I don't actually know how they finally did it, but this is simply mm -hmm. through trigonometry. It's simple yeah. angles, really, because if you think about it, we have like two lines. We know each of their each of their lengths, and we need to find the length to it. We know the length from the both of us. Again, if you're listening to us, this might be really <laughs> hard because I'm doing very many yeah. hand, hand expressions. But if you know the length between two people, and you know the length that it's traversed, I'm sure there's some calculation that you can do to get the so distance. we need to know the distance to venus right not at this point so how does the how does the distance to venus um in relation to the sun play into this diagram let me just read this out and let's see if this helps eh haley proposed that an easy way to measure the difference between the lengths of these two paths would be to tr time the transits using the four phases of the transits, right? That we've spoken about, the yep. ingress and egress times. Mm -hmm. So measure the difference between the lengths of these two paths. With the two different paths known, the distance between the earth and sun can be pretty easily calculated. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I don't actually know how it's pretty easily Interesting. calculated. Interesting, the distance? Oh, right here, finding paths. the AU. Finding the AU, right here, right here. The Kepler's third law. So you, during the transit of Venus... We observe Venus at two different points on the sun. Valid. We'll call the angle between the two paths some angle. Thanks to the law, we know the relative distance of all planets from the sun. Oh, so we know that. Right, we know right. That we know already. relative distances. Right, okay. right. Because we know the relative distances that can, I'm assuming, oh, give us... Oh, because, because, because period, 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 period and, exactly, period, and period, distance. Period, yeah, distance, okay. Period, that makes distance, sense. relationship. That makes sense. So via Kepler's laws... Okay, which now that makes made, sense. ...which have already been made we were able to yeah. get the angle and therefore extrapolate the distance. Yeah, because if you if you Because we know, have the relative distance Because there's, there's Venus. us, Venus, and the sun. Yeah. If you know the distance between us and Venus, then simply observing how it moves, right, against the background of the we sun... We can simply compare you can just, just multiple, yeah, scale it. Because scale yeah. we know that the Venus distance from the sun is 0. 0.72 times Earth-Sun distance via Kepler's third law. So... Going with that analogy, again, assuming the orbits are circular, right? But elliptical. assuming, I mean, us, right, because technically it is elliptical, but with this, the, these are under pretty harsh assumptions yeah, yeah, because yeah. They're like they're assuming they're not like going all wonky because in actuality, right, like they go, like the perigee apogees are not like very similar. It's not very circular, cir circular at all. So other things have to be taken into consideration, but with a simple a good approximation, yeah. It definitely works. Yeah. And that that was like the first official way to do it, like in the 1700s. Interesting, actually. Which was a very, very interesting and you got to definitely pull out your logic. Wait, there. why can't you just work out the period of the Earth and get <laughs> the semi-major axis from there? Would you know You need the, the mass uh, of the Earth. You need the mass, but I don't... I'm assuming 1700s. Yeah, maybe not. You would probably... I know the mass? Would, of the earth how would you <laughs> i don't know no. <laughs> maybe maybe the mass was calculated from kepler's third law knowing the distance right who knows that would be pretty funny wouldn't it? google yeah, probably knows but funny. that would be pretty funny. we don't have to google everything right right, right. um okay well slight yeah <laughs> slight embarrassment but yeah most of that story checks out basically how it happened still very impressive Mm -hmm. Still very impressive, regardless. And also the radius of the sun. I'm guessing it was calculated in a similar way. If you know the distance, Transits then again, the... You can, do, you can the, do radius. No, you can do the uh, subtended angle. If you know the distance, the angle, then you can calculate the radius. Something like that. Yeah, because you can know two, two, two different spots also, right? on the. No, you don't have to know that, right? If you look at the sun... You know the distance and the subtended angle. Oh right. Then so you can get the angular, get the, angular yeah. diameter kind of thing. Right, yeah. right, right. And we also know that it's pretty much like the angle is pretty much the same as the moon. 
Right. So, no, but remember this. Um, oh, yeah, that's also very important. We actually, the whole idea was because the angle that it subtends in the night sky is similar to the moon. You might be thinking, oh, why don't we do the same thing to find the sun that we did the moon, which was parallax, which was just like two different spots on the moon. I mean, on the earth. And just looking at one spot on the moon and then doing your simple parallax calculation. Yeah. But for the sun, again, you can't really look at anywhere on the sun. Yeah. And you can't really figure out a spot to yeah. place it on the sun when you say, hey, look there. Yeah. Where? You know? <laughs> so that's one unfortunate thing for the sun. So that's why we had to think of a little smarter way to do it, which is why originally Aristo Damn it. It's with Aristosthenes. A. No, no. I wish it was. That's E. Oh, yeah. Um, well, another interesting thing so. is how the moon isn't bigger or smaller than it actually is. Because eclipses would be way different, mm. right? If it was smaller and it would never actually cover the entire projected area of the sun. Right. Or if it was bigger and you couldn't even see anything, it was just straight nighttime. Straight dark darkness. That would be crazy. Or even if if it was like way bigger and it eclipsed the entire earth i think it would have to be a lot bigger for that to happen but that would be wild that would be very huge for it to be that big mm. also i don't even know if that would be stable anymore <laughs> aristarchus wow aristarchus 200 bc yes realize when the moon was half illuminated it formed a right angle triangle there mm. it is so again very very much off but he still had the right idea the idea was definitely there. If you would have got the angle correct, it would have been fine. It's just that the way of measuring it was quite, quite terrible. Yeah. I also, I believe that right now as a scientist, it's very interesting to, you know, be a part of what we are trying to do, right? Like pushing the frontier of science. But even, I think at any point in history, it would have been the case, right? Right. When you're trying to figure out what the ratio between the diameter and the circumference of a circle is, mm -hmm. no one has any idea. <laughs> Absolutely wild. Can't even imagine. Like that has to be such an interesting period to be alive in. Right. And even with all of these calculations. I think a lot of things happen like in the BCs. And then nothing happened to like the 1600s. Like that is not 1400s. true. That I is mean, not true. Kind of true. <laughs> what? I, I don't hear of anything that happened in like 500 what? or like 700. I guess actually, nah, no, that's that is not true. not true. That's not really true. No, there have been discoveries. Like Eratosthenes was point. AD, wasn't he? I'm pretty sure. I'm not sure. No. But I think, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there were a lot of discoveries. It's just that, again, we're at such a point in our life where, where all these are. small discoveries that were made so foundational to what we have today are just thought of as like, oh, it's just, it's just basic. It's just basic. Like understanding that static friction, you know, it, it increases and then drops the kinetic friction. Like that, that's just basic. It's fundamental. But 500 years ago, come on, come on, you know? Mm -hmm. So that whole, the whole idea is it's just very different to think about. So it's very nice. But it's always interesting that we have these kind of episodes, I think, to try and go a little bit. Again, as you very well said, not far from physics. It's still very much physics, but just less of the, what we think of today as physics. And more of just, you know, seeing into what they did in the past. Because as you very well said, I think it would be beautiful to live there. It would. Yeah. Imagine. Looking at the sun just and trying to connect the dots yeah. when you just have no clue. That would be pretty right? interesting. There are, there are stars. There are some stars that wander. There's the sun, the moon. And you just have to try to explain mm -hmm. <laughs> what it yeah. is crazy time i mean we're doing the same thing though you know radiation more advanced but really old radiation right. what do you gotta say about that right, <laughs> right. right. Exactly. but i think we we do have a pretty good idea but i think everybody at every point in time said that mm -hmm. so i guess realistically well, there's just like, progress has no limit yeah nice way nice way to finish that up. actually one last thing i okay. guess um I think maybe there is a limit because of the uncertainty principle. Cause at a certain at a certain distance in time from this point going backwards, the universe was smaller than 
let's say a plank length right we don't know that but sure or even let's say it was always technically it was a singularity so right. yeah but, le- point. but let's say let's say it grew to two plank lengths <laughs> plank lengths that's not how the universe's expansion but, worked or at least how we believe that the what it exploded pretty quickly yeah but it there had to be some time interval when it was two plank lengths yeah okay. right yeah. okay then I, what? <laughs> either i don't <laughs> you're saying there was a limit then i mean maybe no but let's say the universe was that size then literally everything inside of the universe was like infinite position uncertainty and infinite momentum uncertainty right so there is kind of a limit to how far back we can predict things to mm. right that's a nice way to think about it actually. yeah right that's a nice way to think about it at some point everything just because if you think about it it's kind of like a camera where when you take a picture right now you you see everything clearly but if you back things up and you you keep the focus at the same place mm-hmm. but you back the subject up it'll just get blurrier and blurrier until it, like the blur just becomes uniform and then at that point you can't say anything about what the subject actually is everything just becomes totally uncertain about where it is and where it's going so you right just, you just can't say yeah there's nothing else to say yeah yeah well yeah I thank guess. you as always for uh checking up on us <laughs> yeah. watching this episode hopefully hopefully you guys liked it a little different style but uh, yeah. let us know if you want us to keep doing these kind of things maybe we can do the history of other things talking about a history of other things oh. history of physics episode gonna come shortly uh, put it, it in the comments or DM us or whatever you want. It could be the next episode. We could can, be the next we can episode. make the effort to could be the next episode. put out a history so of physics. So let us know if you have any recommendations on who you want. If not, we're probably just going to decide some people. We but do if, have recommendations, by we, the way. Oh, never. We have some. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Never mind that. We have a lot, actually. Okay. Never mind that. <laughs> yeah. So. Thank you, to everyone. Thank you. This is uh, episode 104 of the Math and Physics podcast. I'm your host, Parker. And I'm Ray. And we'll see you soon. Bye.